So if there's nothing more then for David, may we move on to the next item, which is the patient and public voice. Tim, again, building on what I was saying earlier, uh, the NHS belongs to the people and the patient and public voice is our guiding uh, well, principles. Uh, Absolutely. And we, of course, we heard that incredibly clearly at the brilliant AGM yesterday, for which I have to say I must thank my staff for having done such a brilliant job in, in making that happen. The first ever AGM in the NHS in its history. And what we heard, I think, really clearly was just the, 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 the fundamental importance to so many people in that room of greater participation, of, of NHS England really making a, a, a substantial proper difference in the way in which the NHS properly accounts for the patient voice, listens and learns to listen. And, and there was a phrase um, that sort of has stayed with me where, um, where, where one of the feedback panellists described the importance of NHS England, the NHS at large, learning to walk in the shoes of the patient. Um, so in a sense, that may not be obviously what's, that may not necessarily at first glance be the point of this paper, but it is the point of this paper. This, this is all about how we can properly listen to those we are serving. So, um, and, and this particular, in, in this, as it were, board, uh, in, this, in the paper this time, we focus specifically on what we're doing in relation to feedback um, and voice. And Friends and Family Test uh, launched in July, um, unprecedented around the world. There are health systems that use the Friends and Family Test, or as some people know, the Net Promoter Score. Um, and in this, in this, uh, test we are simply asking people to tell us whether they would recommend a service to their friend and family in a way providing us with a gauge of satisfaction um, uh, that that, uh, and, and the quality of their experience um, but principally thus far um, the friends and family test has been used by other industries to enormous effect so 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 impressive in fact are the results from a variety of, of industries around the world that not only does the friends and family test provide a, a proper accountability of a, of a quality, quality in a service but but that actually it drives real improvement inside the the service that, that this is why we've we've so uh, seriously adopted it for the NHS and as I say we are the first um, health system uh, that's adopted it nationally anywhere in the world um, what we as the paper describes uh, so far um, in the most late We've now had two months of publication. More than half a million patients have given us their views across the entirety of NHS England in the context of inpatient wards and A&E departments. Um, response rates have been much better than we'd anticipated. Um, broadly put, nationally, the response rate has been over 15% of all patients in those contexts, which I think is staggering. I think it's an amazing achievement. Um, obviously, in many places, as <clears throat> As we've just heard, there are challenges around response rates, um, particularly in A&E departments, where I think just the pressures of everyday working um, in current circumstances and the, the way in which people use A&E departments, just the way they flow in and out, has meant that it's been more difficult to offer them the opportunity of, of giving feedback on services. And, and in some cases, I'm really hoping that publication of response rates will help drive up, um, as it were, local concentration on different approaches to um, to making it happen. So, for example, one big hospital, King's in London, um, when, when they started collecting the data, was reporting about 3% response rates in their A&E department. They were very unhappy about that. They felt that they, they definitely wanted to get that higher. And with a combination of promotional activity, literally on site, with the local community, they now got that well over 15%. So, so I think there's lots that can be done, and we're supporting uh, providers who are finding it difficult in A&Es. But in, in inpatient ward context, actually, the response rates have been very, very high. Sometimes they're over 80%. So that, that really is getting to a point where it becomes very, very valuable. Um, and I've spent quite a lot of time myself just, just in a way, testing this, this presumption that, that something that's been so important in other industries can have real value in healthcare, a very different context, to say, a retailer or a, or a bank. Um, and I, I went on a, a visit to uh, another London hospital, the Chelsea Westminster Hospital, where, honestly, the, the level of enthusiasm amongst the nursing staff in the A&E department, just for a, for a, for a, for a, a conversation that they just hadn't really had before, a means of you know, very directly a patient telling them they didn't like the environment, it was too noisy, they felt isolated, they didn't feel they were being communicated with, um, was incredibly empowering for the nurses. And, and the doctors to be able to just get on and, and change the way they were doing things. So, so I think um, we are, and the paper includes some other examples of ways in which right now, you know, right at the start, this is already, I think, driving different attitudes to listening and, and to driving improvement. So that's the friends and family test. And one just other point uh, to raise without going for too long. Um, there's been quite a lot of discussion about the methodology of the friends and family test. Um, and and it, 
you know, the NHS, like many public services, has, been, has got very used to, correctly got very used to sort of measuring itself where it can with hard administrative data, you know, sort of very hard-edged clinical data in this case, and has actually not really done very much at all at understanding how to think about softer intelligence, kind of what other industries would call market research or customer insight information. Um, and, and in a sense, they're different classes of data. So hard data, statistics, um, we, we sort of understand, but this softer intelligence is much more providing us with kind of line of sight um, insight into whether things are going well or badly over time, looking at providers with a broader, a broader, more sort of generalised brush. So we did not specify, for example, in the first iteration of friends and family tests that hospitals should be told how they were going to collect it. We specified, obviously, the question that they would be asking, but not how they would collect it. And, and actually, it doesn't really matter, because what matters is the volume of people giving their responses to particular questions. So just to make that point, um, that there's a proper and robust debate going on about whether or not we should refine the methodology in this way or that way, and obviously we're reflecting on it. But the, the overall importance of this is as a line of sight, softer measure of the way people are experiencing services. Just one other thing, I'd, two other things I'd actually quite like to highlight. Um, Alongside that, we've also launched uh, another initiative, which at the moment certainly isn't, isn't mandatory and is in a sort of experimental phase, which is to try and offer, to use the power of social media and other channels to offer people the opportunity to feed back directly to their clinician in, in, at, their, at their own convenience. So, you know, I've, I've been waiting too long in a ward here or in a, in a waiting room there, I've, and I want to let my clinician, my local hospital manager, know that. So, so we've launched this programme called Care Connect in London and the North East, which is providing people with the opportunity to text or tweet, to, to ring in on a phone number, to email comments, um, complaints, compliments, uh, and those comments are being, are being then reported where, where the uh, commenter uh, is happy with us doing so in real time on a map, so you can, everybody can see it, the power of transparency, just driving awareness of complaints um, in local hospitals and comments. And, and, and already, again, that's proved to be uh, welcomed by the hospitals that are participating in the trial. They're finding it really useful, quite challenging. Uh, as, you, as you'll note, there are one or two um, examples here of people, you know, making, I think, important comments about the way services are not delivering as you would expect, but this is all part of the conversation that, that we need to develop. So at the moment we're looking at potentially rolling out Care Connect as a national offer um, in the course of next year, but just another, another thing to, to, I hope, demonstrate to everybody that NHS England is really very, very serious about putting participation absolutely at the heart of its, of its agenda, priorities. And then finally, another initiative which, which is also unprecedented, again, a demonstration of our commitment to transparency and participation, which is um, uh, uh, the, the funding of uh, 20 uh, pilots within our specialist services, specialist commissioning um, uh, area to give patients the opportunity to start recording their own data. So uh, a really important ingredient of being able to commission for outcomes is that we, we, we understand sometimes outcomes that a clinician might value are not necessarily the same as those that a patient might value. And we need to have both bits of intelligence on the table when the patient and the doctor or the, or the clinician are having, are having their discussions. So this is about providing a very different route to giving patients, as I say, the opportunity to, to literally keep their own record and for that to be, to be given a parity of esteem in a way with the clinical data that's, that's held over here. And you can understand perhaps the importance of that in, say, cleft lip and palate services where for the parent and for the child, the important outcome is, is speech development for the surgeon, of course, they'll be worried about harm in the theatre as the cleft is being fixed. But these two things, are, neither of them are unimportant. Both have, have probably equal importance, but they both need to be present when we're thinking about the kind of outcomes we want to commission. So, so that's a very exciting uh, new initiative which will be launched shortly as well. Um, very happy. Uh, there are obviously other things in the document. Very happy to take any questions on those, on those things. Well, thank you very much, Tim. I know we're going to come back to FFT when we look at the um, performance report yeah. overall and we can uh, start to track trends. But let me invite uh, questions or comments from members of the board. Very good. Victor? Very good. Uh, just, um, this, is, this is excellent. I, I just wanted to invite Tim to emphasise that this work is not just about hospitals, because the NHS yeah. And secondly, I'm curious, I'm curious as to when we will get a sense of how this... Uh, feedback breaks down by demographic, you know, with reference to the yeah. ideas of um, disadvantage, 
Um, when are we going to get a look at that? Um, and what kind of good practice is resulting already as a result of this information being fed back to yeah. providers? Well, can I just say, of course, uh, sorry, I should have said, of course, it's not just about hospitals. That's sort of where we started. And to be clear, uh, we're already committed uh, to the rollout of friends and family tests to maternity departments in October. That's that's going well to all primary care um, contexts by December of 2014 and to the entire NHS um, by March of 2015. So that is a public commitment which we are on track to deliver. So absolutely uh, not just about hospitals. Um, in relation to, uh, you know, we had a very important conversation yesterday about inequalities and the, the, the correct priority we should be placing on demonstrating we're having impact there. And an absolutely critical part of, of the way we use this feedback to help inform us is going to be how it can drive social justice in delivery of, of NHS services. Friends and Family Test at the moment doesn't properly capture that. So that's one of the design refinements we're going to be making so that people can can give us some insight when they're, when they're describing whether they're satisfied with the local service into what their you know their, their, their ethnic background is and, and so on so that's something we, w we will be adding care connect can already do that so so with I mean certainly these sources of intelligence should be fund very very important to the way in which we design um, our, our inequalities and equality strategy moving forward so very mindful of that but thank you for the reminder I think I've got Bill McCarthy David and Moira and Nagy Thanks, Thanks, Chairman. I, I just wanted to pick up on Victor's first question, and not just hospitals, and, and particularly to mention mental health services, where over the past few weeks I've, I've been speaking both with chief executives and, and, and staff of mental health care providers, but, but as well as with a number of service users. And there is a great deal of enthusiasm in those services to embrace friends and family test. Indeed, they start from quite a strong, a strong tradition of uh, really good, uh, you know, articulate engagement. And uh, e e even though, as Tim said, the commitment is uh, not till 2015, certainly there's a whole number of yeah. mental health providers who are keen to, to, to get going early. And certainly we're very happy support that as, as an important part of demonstrating our commitment to parity of esteem. Thank you, David. Well, I was, I was going to say something. I was at a, a mental health provider last week, and um, they are absolutely, you know, they want to get into this. They were, in fact, they, in fact, I have to say, I was in Ashworth Hospital, and a patient in Ashworth Hospital asked me why they didn't get the opportunity to fill in friends and family. So, I mean, it, you know, I, it, it is, it, there is a huge amount of, of kind of enthusiasm for it, and I think we should go with that. I think that's a really important part of it. It just strikes me, Tim, though, that the one of one of the issues for me is if, if you. Re when we did high quality care for all and one of the things we did about what made a great clinical team and what made a great clinical team were, were, were people who measured things who set themselves goals and then delivered those goals and then started to think hold on how am I doing compared with my colleagues in another hospital or whatever and then start to benchmark themselves and then set themselves that was a kind of a, a kind of a thing and you can absolutely see now how the friends and family and the benchmarking bit of that for individuals will be more and more important so I think in terms of seems to me in terms of the rigor in which we expect people to measure it and the methodology I think that pressure to be more standardized about it I think will get greater as we go through that who people look outside of their organization so that, that's that's the only point I make and the other point is um, uh, the Care Connect stuff, which I think is really genuinely for people who run hospitals transformational. I mean, I'm a, you know, I've been around a long time, you know, I've done lots of, lots of jobs, but talking to a, a chief executive of a hospital in London where um, it completely transforms the nature of their job and what they do because they know on an hourly, daily basis what their patients are saying and what the issues are in their hospital. And it changes the things that you do. And I think that makes a... And I mean, the power of this, I think, is really, really significant and could make just such a massive difference in the way, the way all of us think about our jobs and the things we do, which is precisely the, the point of it. Really. Thank you. Myra. Um, thank you. Welcome. Um, two things, really, uh, on this, which um, were prompted by last night's AGM, actually. Um, I think it's really, really good and really encouraging, and I agree with David about the potential. Um, but um, while we congratulate ourselves as having had our first AGM, um, actually, we had a member of the audience who pointed out that there's lots of public 
opportunities that have been lost in the new system that you know PCTs aren't having meetings in public and um, uh, so I think that's what we did I think you commit Malcolm to uh, reflect on that or perhaps David you said that we would reflect on that and I think it's important to you know that pa patient and public voice is, um, is wider than just the commissioning board um, but secondly of the other thing we committed to was the um, you said we did reporting back next year and actually it's much easier for um, uh, providers to to have that kind of responsiveness. Um, so, do you think it will help us on the uh, you said we did, or do we need to have another um, uh, process in the sense of being clear? You know, there are lots lots of things that are being influenced in what NHS England does with, from the patient voice, but it's a capturing it really for that accountability uh, in a very short period of time, really. Yeah, so, well, there are two bits to, the, to answer that question. The first one is that um, Victor, of course, is uh, the, it isn't in this paper, but we'll be bringing back to the next meeting an update on this, is leading work on designing the, the Citizens' Assembly, which which I, which I won't be just a national monolithic thing. It'll be at all, all over the NHS, as it were, as a social network and as a physical set of kind of conversations that are happening. Um, and that's been through a series of kind of very substantial collaborative conversations with all sorts of different stakeholders and I think we're getting to a pretty good place. So that, that may help with the specifics about how can NHS England be held to account locally in lots of different care contexts in a way that's meaningful. It, mm. As you say, things that have, perhaps have been lost uh, from, from the old system which had you know different organisations and so on. Um, but just in terms of how we can demonstrate our own well, I hope achievement, but you know the degree to which we have delivered on on this commitment to transparency, participation, and to properly representing the voices. The I think the patient insight dashboard, which is referenced in here, is going to be a pretty important piece of our of our you know of that conversation. So, as you'll remember, we've we've committed to creating a an online tool which will be open to everybody, which has a variety of different informational feeds on it, which will in a way provide a, a point of aggregating things like comments and complaints and just general feedback in ways which which will tell us whether we're having any impact or not through the various uh, policies we're, we're, we're enacting. Um, that will become a routine part of the board re board's work in a, in a couple of months' time. It's currently going out to public consultation, and we're having a lot of very big conversations, you can imagine, with all sorts of people about what that should look like and what kinds of data should be in it. But so th I think that will be an important part of answering the have we done anything question. Nagi, then then Jane. understand how we're going about doing this. So the data is being sourced um, at the operational point of delivery yeah. by providers. Yeah. Can you just help me understand like who organizes the collection of the data? Is it the the hospital staff themselves or your team is sort of out there? How does that work? And can you give us a sense of what we're spending on this? And is the spend by NHS England, or is it in the hospitals? So the, the method. So the, the, the way the, the hospital collects the data, they manage the entire collection process, they also manage the process of reporting the results of that data. Um, the data is considered an official statistic. Which it has certain, which imposes certain legal obligations on the provider to, for example, uh, you know, collect it honestly and, yeah. and without without any sort of gaming, and you know, to do, do it properly. And actually, it's a criminal offence to game this data in its collection, as with other official statistics. Um, so that's their responsibility. The providers are incentivised uh, through um, through sequent payments for meeting response rates that we think are. You know, satisfactory. So, 15% as a combined response rate is the is the level you have to have reached in order to qualify for your sequin incentive payment as a hospital. So, so NHS England makes a payment to the hospital for doing that. Well, the hospital is paid more from its commissioner, right. whether that's NHS England or the CCG, on an incentive basis through that sequin mechanism. So, kind of the system is providing an incentive to the hospital through through the contract. Um, and um, and in fact, so the cost the co the cost is very slight. I mean, to be honest, most most ho well many hospitals are running their collections using online tools that are provided to them by, by third party commercial vendors for free. So so literally, all they have to do is direct patients at the 
online form and invite them to fill it in. Um, the, the, the rest of the processing is managed by by organisations who are who are actually providing that service for free at the moment. So so the cost overall is is very slight. Clearly, NHS England has invested its funds, um, which are pretty limited, in really just providing guidance, support, and we are on the ground helping hospitals, uh, which are finding it difficult to you know to manage response rates or with the best support we can. So there's an, there's an element of being on the ground, but we're not responsible for the collection itself. Some of the coverage has been uh, somewhere about the costs is completely off. Yeah, off completely. So just to be clear, there was coverage in the in the media about a staggeringly large yeah. cost associated with friends and family tests, which I still can't quite find out where those have come from, but I think that reflects original sort of impact assessments that were done some time ago by the Department of Health based on assumptions that I, hope I can't speak for. But, mm -hmm. but as things stand, uh, the costs are very low um, in any, you know, yeah. Jane? I just wanted to respond to um, Moira's question about a bit more about well, what would be done as a result. And I just thought it was worth just updating the board on um, a, part, a further pilot that's going to be done in the north of England with 35 organisations, which, and that, which is linked to the transparency work and also to compassion and practice, the nursing strategy. And what they're planning to do is um, collect information and publish around um, incidents of falls and pressure ulcers, for example, but to link that with FFT and staff experience um, responses. Um, and to publish that on a monthly basis. Um, but the, the key part about this is every month there'll be a, you said, we did. So there'll be a description of what they have done at a very granular level. So, for example, a ward or service level, which describes how they've responded to both incidents of potential harm or actual harm to patients who have fallen, for example, but also what staff have said about their experience and what the patients have said about their experience. And I think the first publication of that is likely to be towards the end of November. But that will be 35 organisations across the board looking at what they're doing and being very open and transparent about what they've actually done as a result, which I think will be really meaningful to people. Can I just <clears throat> absolutely reinforce what uh, David said about Care Connect? Um, that, to me, is a fantastic initiative. Um, and I think it would be great for the board to see how that, that develops. I think it's, as David said, transformation on the ground. It would be helpful to have a view as to whether you've shown it to Judy Meller uh, yeah. yet and whether the health service onwards and sees that as a, an advance on, shall we say, the, the messaging that she was getting back about complaints. So um, Care Connect, to be clear, was intended originally just as an experiment with seeing the degree to which there was a public appetite for, for in a way, sharing the job of managing hospitals or, or other provider institutions and literally being part of uh, in a very real up it, however it has it does it does have I think real um, value potentially in in being the vehicle through which the the health and care system as a whole can offer a much more a much easier point of access to people who want to make complaints and so uh, Julia certainly her, I've spoken to Julia about it she, she I think um, is very enthusiastic about the opportunities for working with us on developing Care Connect as a and, and indeed other regulators as well as a mechanism not just for feedback but also actually to help direct people much in a much more sort of accessible easy fashion to different points in the system where they might want to make a complaint about a particular service so we're working with her very closely at the moment and I think that's partly that'll be partly when when and if we roll it out nationally that'll be I think a very core part of the offer we're, we're making to patients. Good. Well, thank you very much, Tim, for the paper and for the report. I think this is one of the most innovative things that we've been doing. And um, I know the board would wish to commend uh, the work of you and your team. Uh, we need to remind ourselves that this is one of the five domains uh, that we're required to report against um, to ensure uh, that we understand uh, what is the satisfaction of, of, of patients and the public with what we provide by way of the NHS. Secondly, our responsibility is to, com is to commission the highest quality health care and uh, we need to find out what it is that the consumers of high quality health care actually think about it and I think the FFT and the, uh, the care data um, uh, material is absolutely critical to our understanding of that. It's early stages, um, this is highly experimental, uh, but I think already we have a feeling of some assurance to the board that we're going in the right direction. I think the third element of it which you emphasised in your remarks was how it drives improvement across yeah. the system. It, it, it opens up 
uh, an understanding of, of, of patient satisfaction with services and drives a positive response which otherwise uh, doesn't get done because people feel very frustrated about not having have a mechanism uh, to express their concerns about the service that they're getting. So it, in one sense it's simple consumerism, uh, but in another sense I think it's a dynamic force for um, change uh, throughout the NHS. So. Um, it will come back to us this morning in the performance report and we will at every meeting be tracking our performance uh, through, the, through that mechanism. But I think the salience of the issue is demonstrated by the positioning of the paper this morning at the head of the agenda uh, for the board meeting and the attention that we've given to it. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, the next item on the agenda, Tim, I'm afraid, is back to you, which is the publication of the directions to the Health and Social Care Information Centre. So, um, in, a, in a different but related way, this, this is just as important as all the things we've, we've also talked about. One of the biggest challenges to the, to, well, not just commissioning for outcomes, but actually having improving outcomes in healthcare is the absence in large parts of data with which we can actually measure the quality of healthcare. Um, and there are still very, very many fundamental questions which commissioners and patients will want to ask which simply can't be answered without better access to data. So uh, you'll, the board, I, I've, I've presented the board um, in, in the past on care.data, which is our programme to transform data services in healthcare, working very closely with our partner, the Health and Social Care Information Centre. Um, and the first phase of this, I think, frankly, radical um, transformative programme to put better data in the hands of clinicians and patients is to um, provide them with, for the first time, proper routine access to anonymised information about primary care services, and in particular general practice. Um, we've spent a lot of time consulting on the nature of that request and, and recognise absolutely the proper um, concerns that both uh, primary care clinicians and Pub the public at large have around confidentiality to make sure that we balance uh, any we requirement for data with very clear evidence of benefit in its extraction and at the same time guarantee uh, confidentiality uh, to patients. So the paper before you uh, describes the specifics uh, in relation to the extraction of data from general practice. Uh, we, are, we are required to um, legally direct the Health and Social Care Information Centre to begin the extraction. Um, the extraction has been agreed, um, and I, I, I'm, you know, I'd like to also thank uh, them for their support by the BMA, by the Royal College of General Practice. We're working very closely with the Information Commissioner on how best to promote um, this new initiative to the public so that they are fully aware of their rights in relation to the, the data that's being extracted. There's been a, there's been a lot of misreporting about this in the media. Um, and uh, there have been quite a few corrections published in the same media following the subsequent conversations. But essentially, um, the, the important features of this are that um, it's about anonymized data being shared with third parties who are commissioning services, who are progressing science, who are developing new innovative approaches to patient care. No confidential data is going to be circulated to those parties without uh, specific parliamentary approvals um, and uh, so headlines saying that confidential data is being sold for a pound are completely erroneous and factually utterly incorrect and have largely been corrected. Um, the, the, the sold for a pound bit reflects our other commitment which is to make um, safely to make this data as widely available as we can. We want, we do not want, we want innovators of all sorts to be able to access it um, so we're not going to charge them for it. So for a pound means effectively we're giving it away for free because we believe that the greatest value to the taxpayer and the British economy is going to be in the sorts of, 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 of enterprise that will be developed, life sciences, in life sciences and elsewhere, by, by giving people much freer uh, access to this uh, amazingly valuable uh, data. So, so the first part of the programme is to drive be better informed commissioning. Um, that's what the instructions of the Information Centre is for. Um, so I'd commend it to the board and hope that the board would share with me a, a real sense of this being a, a genuine turning point in, 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 the, in the development of our health service. Um, and um, that's it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, any questions to Tim? I mean, I think this, the, the legal process here is, is a very straightforward one. Uh, what it unlocks, of course, is the great wealth of data uh, that the NHS has always had. Uh, but has been uh, 
let's say, less than totally effective in deploying uh, to the benefit not only of commissioning but also uh, more generally of understanding what interventions work and, and, and understanding the system as a whole. So I have a Kieran and Bruce and Nagi. Kieran? majority of patients have an expectation that the data will be shared for the greater good, uh, so that the next person to have the same condition will have a better chance of recovery. So I think there's a, a, a real momentum behind this, subject to all the usual uh, safeguards. So I, I, I think this is the beginning of something which will be really powerful, and I, I, th I think there's a lot of support out there for it. So well done. Bruce? Thank you. Mine's a, a follow-on from Kieran's, really. Um, people are very supportive this subject to concerns about confidentiality to particularly in the face of some of the stuff that's been in the media over the last year or so so I wonder if you could just spell out a little bit more about the um, the safeguards yeah and, and, and thanks for asking that question because I, I I wanted to be really clear that the overriding priority in this program and in all the other work we're doing to sort of liberate data, as it were, with, within the health service is patient confidentiality. So we've taken the rather exceptional step, which has been previously noted by the board, to not only <clears throat> encourage and, uh, uh, as we must, advertise to people, patients, the, you know, the public at large, their, their legal rights in relation to this data, which are that they can object to its extraction from their general practice. Um, and for that, uh, currently the law would, 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 would require then the GP to make a judgment about whether or not that objection in their view is reasonable. That's that, they're the data controller, that's the law. We've actually gone one step further than that with this release to say that when somebody objects to that, to, to that extraction, for whatever reason, even though we all think it's the right thing to do, you know, people may choose to take a different view, that that objection, regardless of what the GP thinks, will be upheld. So in a de facto sense, not only are we guaranteeing people's confidentiality, but we're actually raising the bar on giving them proper choice as to whether they want to participate. Um, and I hope that will sort of set a standard, not just for healthcare, but across government. Uh, and one thing I, I think we can do as NHS England is to be just absolutely clear that this is an absolute priority for us. Without trust, if we for one second lose public confidence in the way in which we are conducting our commissioning analysis on their behalf, we, we, are, we are sunk. So. Tim, when um, data extraction was used for the summary care record, it was the GPs themselves that were concerned about the level yeah. of confidentiality, yeah. uh, legitimately so. And yeah. I, I just wonder how well you've engaged them so that this is, <coughs> so that they become advocates. Yeah. So, so we, as I say, we spend a lot of time with the British Medical Association and the Royal College of General Practice, where a lot of, you know, properly robust discussion around the degree to which we were going to properly, um, uh, you know, safeguard patients' um, confidentiality. Uh, the pro, there's a, there's a quite intensive, wide, large-scale program to make sure that every GP in the country is absolutely clear about what, what this is about. Is clear about their obligations in relation to. Um, advertising to their own patients' uh, rights and so on and so forth, um, and that's a combination of you know direct direct mail and and meetings and conferences and so on. so so we've invested really quite a lot of time um, and resource in making sure that we we do get round and explain to every GP and and hopefully you now we're able to deal with their issues. That's not to say though that there aren't a minority of GPs who have expressed directly to me you know real concerns about this. Um, and I, I'm just, my belief is that first of all, we, can, we will be able to demonstrate quickly that we, we, we as a system are absolutely more than capable, as we did with the summary care record, of properly um, safeguarding people's confidentiality. And perhaps more importantly than that, quickly demonstrating what benefit this data can bring to uh, patient outcomes. So I think a combination of, of those things, I hope, will allay the, the concerns even of the most um, worried general practitioner. But the vast majority from my own, uh, uh, from, from our work so far, are supportive and actually quite, you know, genuinely pleased with the way in which we have addressed this issue of, of, of um, automatically upholding people's objections where, where they're made. My points were just uh, building on the same issue, really. So. For clarification, it's the GPs themselves who are responsible for making sure that the data is anonymised. So that happens at the GP practice. Is that no, right? 
Yeah. So it, the, the, one of the most important values that this initiative brings is the ability for this date, the, the prime GP data, to be linked to hospital data. So at the moment we have no means of assessing an outcome across the pathway of a patient's care except in very sp specific audited circumstances. Um, so that's, that to do that, the data needs to be um, needs to be uh, ex extracted into the safe haven of the information centre, which is the legal safe haven under the Health and Social Care Act that's, that's allowed to handle patient identifiable data so that it can be linked to hospital data and then anonymised. So the anonymisation yeah. takes place in the information centre, not in the GP practice. And who has the managerial responsibility for that? So the, the information centre is an independent arm's length body with its own board and in fact yesterday published its code of practice which reinforces all the things I've said about patient confidentiality and so on. Um, and we, the, the purpose of this paper is that we as an AL, an arm's length body, are, now, are required legally in, in um, implementation of our own legal responsibilities in the Act to instruct them as an independent body to go ahead and make the collection. But it's their responsibility to safely handle the, the linkage of, of, the, of the identifiable data within their own... And, and who haven. has any kind of... Um right to audit that this is going on properly, would, would we be involved in that or that's the information centre would be responsible for that too? Uh, well, th there, are, there are lots of, there are quite a number of bodies that have an interest in this from a number of different directions. So for example, the Care Quality Commission is interested in data quality and will be as part of its routine inspections looking at the quality of data that is generated across care contexts. Uh, the Information Commissioner, of course, is there to, to and has an interest in understanding how providers in the NHS are managing their legal obligations under the Data Protection Act. Uh, we will have a big interest in auditing the degree to which benefit is being derived from this data in the service. So I think our, our interest will be, uh, will be understanding and monitoring the degree to which people are using the data, particularly to commission better for, for patient outcomes, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think more or less everybody has, a, has an interest in one way or another. Um, it's a very good point you make, though, about the, the degree to which we can sort of rationalise all those requirements into, a, into an audit, which would uh, minimise any burden on, on providers. Um, and I might take, away, you know, take that away and have a think about it. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. We've got the ability to make this the very best in the world because of yeah. the, the integrated nature of yeah. the NHS. I mean, what are the risks and benefits that we can see from other jurisdictions who have um, attempted to, to do this sort of work? Well, um, I mean, there are, so in a way, the, the, you know, the best healthcare systems in the world, none of them national, that have just prioritised the sharing of safe sharing of data and, and alongside that uh, the proper exploitation of the values that technology can bring. These two are indivisible. Without data, we can't properly exploit you know, the, the opportunity that technology offers us. Um, they are also the best health systems in the world. So just to give you one example, you know, the Veterans Administration, which is a, um, a sort of a health system that serves um, uh, the armed forces in the US, um, has, is completely automated in ways we, we can only really aspire to at this point, and is, and is routinely has developed all sorts of best-in-class data sharing um, programs, um, as a result of which, uh, you know, and, and they've, they've subjected themselves to all sorts of peer-reviewed examination, they say that a combination of, of proper use of data with proper exploitation of the technology that, that then is enabled has, has cut their bed day admissions, for example, by 25%. So, I mean, and, and we, they are a world-class quality provider of healthcare. So, the, I mean, and there are many other examples. None of them have our complexity or our scale, but they, they, they offer us a really good, you know, in, a good evidence base of why this is so important and perhaps fundamental to the delivery of high quality healthcare for all. And have they all been successful in maintaining security and confidentiality? I can't answer that question, but to my knowledge, yes, but I, I, um, I, I can't, I'd have to go and have a look. Okay, well thank you very much. I think we've had a very good um, review of the, of the programme.